Well, good morning. Last week we talked about unity and not, not necessarily, you know, everybody uh, agreeing on every issue, but certainly understanding that we all need to get along. And I'm sure many of you are aware of the Lord of the Rings books from J.R. Tolkien. Uh, in the first book, The Fellowship of the Ring, Frodo Baggins inherits a ring, which is a weapon of diabolical power. And Frodo, together with a group that includes a dwarf, uh, humans, a wizard, and an elf, they take that one ring on a journey across Middle Earth to its destruction on Mount Doom. And along the way, this ragtag group fights villains, but they also have to deal with the conflict amongst their own group, which is caused by jealousy that the ring creates. And so because of this struggle, the fellowship is quickly splintered into three different groups by the end of the book. The same thing can happen to any group. The same thing can happen to a church. I mean, even looking back at your own life, you've probably witnessed firsthand a relationship or two, either at work or in your family, that was weakened or separated. Relationships are fragile. And like I said last week, it's a very easy thing to divide ourselves. It's easy to find flaws with other people, or it's easy to create division, but unity takes work. And if you don't work at it, our idiosyncrasies uh, will eventually become irritants to unity and relationships will unravel. That's why we follow Paul's instruction in Ephesians 4, make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. I wanna show you some very beautiful pictures, okay? Look at this flower. If I asked you what was wrong with this flower, what would you say? Well, maybe its color is inconsistent. Maybe the picture would have been better if some of the other buds were open. What's wrong with this picture? This is a beautiful sunset, right? What, what could you find wrong with this? Maybe you might say, well, the, the clouds toward the bottom are an ugly gray color. Here's some mountains. What's wrong here? Maybe you could say, well, you know, looking at it, they're all, the, all the mountains in that background, they're all the same height. You know, it should be nice if there were some differences, some diversity. Are those the most beautiful things on the earth? Flowers, sunsets, mountains. Maybe. And yet, we can still look at the most beautiful picture and find a flaw. But here's a question. Is there something even more beautiful than flowers or sunsets or mountains? Puppies? <laughs> what about babies? Nope. It's actually God's church. Ephesians 5 says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, and he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. Paul says, God thinks you're the most beautiful thing in the world. The most lovely thing on earth is his bride, is the church. In fact, earlier in Ephesians, Paul says, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. So it's through the work of the church that God's manifold wisdom, it says, is shown to the world. So tell me something, just, I mean, explain this to me. How is it possible that an institution, a group that brings such pleasure to God and unites people is often filled with bitter complaints and grudges and backstabbing and clicks and judgment, right? Or to put it this way, if the body of Christ is so beautiful, why do believers bug me so much? <laughs> Here's a list I found on the internet of different kinds of annoying people. It was a list of 101 things, 101 
annoying people. I edited it down for you. These are a couple of the highlights, a couple of my favorites. People with annoying voices. People who prove on a regular basis that yes, there is such a thing as a stupid question. The people who got picked first for sports teams in elementary school. People who wear so much perfume that there's an actual visible cloud all of around them. Telemarketers. People who look over at your meal and then just as you're lifting the fork to your mouth, they say with an irritating tone of voice, oh, you're not gonna eat that, are you? People who hum. Dentists who try to have a conversation with you while they're working on your teeth and you can't respond. Little skinny people who complain loudly about how embarrassed they are to have to buy jeans that are about four sizes smaller than the ones you're wearing. People who are so totally perfect you would love to hate them if only they weren't so nice to you all the time. People who talk loudly in public places about their personal problems. Fashion designers. Sports commentators. Salespeople who latch onto you and follow you around the store asking if they can help you, either you until you either give up or buy something or go nuts and beat them to death with a, with a display rack. People who tell long, elaborate jokes that seem to go on forever and then they mess up the punchline. Mothers who let their children run around the store screaming. Mimes. People who put gum on desks and bus seats. People who say nuclear instead of nuclear. Morning people. People who repeat themselves. People who repeat themselves. People who don't realize that it's rude to pick your nose in public. People who answer rhetorical questions. And whomever invented Valentine's Day. My guess is that you have come in contact with difficult people as well. Who gets on your nerves? Who is the sandpaper that rubs you the wrong way? I wanna suggest this morning that it's actually good to have those kinds of people in your life because God uses conflict to help us grow. It might surprise you to know that the Bible has a lot to say on this topic. We're in Romans chapter 15 today. One more chapter and then we're done. And our passage for you this morning gives us six ways that we can bear with one another, especially those people who might try our patience. Romans 15, verse one. We who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up. For Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. For whatever was written in former days was written for your instruction that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Jesus Christ, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. Paul seems to be writing that he says to two groups of people. He calls them weak people, and strong people, probably two groups that had friction, that graded on each other. And the big problem back then was whether it was okay for a Christian to be offered meat that had been sacrificed to an idol, to eat food that was unclean, or perhaps to still continue to observe a Jewish holiday now that we're no longer under the law. And the strong saints, according to Paul, they didn't have a problem with any of it. Jewish Christians felt that if they ate meat containing uh, certain things that could make a person unclean, so one group follows a strict diet and they continued to follow and observe some rituals and holidays and others didn't. So naturally, the weaker believers are bothered by the stronger believers and vice versa. And you know what? This is not an ancient conflict. This is not a topic that is foreign, that we can't identify with. I'm sure we can easily fall into thinking that the way we do things, from our perspective, is the right way to think and act. And those who differ with us, well, they must be wrong. In fact, some of us will go out of our way to control how others believe and think and behave, all the while secretly judging them because we have a standard. And I think if given the choice, most of us, we would categorize ourselves 
as being strong. You know, if I said, which, which one are you? You would say, well, I'm strong and others are weak. And before we go too far down this road, just like we pointed out last week, we should repeat this, we're not talking about issues of sin. The Bible never tells us to turn a blind eye to sin or to wash over another person's sin, but we are called to show grace to each other, to forgive one another, and to strive for peace. So what does our passage say? Well, we can look at each verse individually. Look at verse 1. It says, we who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. In other words, we should put up with each other, right? What does it mean to bear with the failings of the weak? Quite simply, it means you put up with one another. That word bear is the Greek word aphelio. It's the same word, same word you would use to uh, talk about if you owed somebody money. You owe them something, right? It's, an, it's a debt. This is, this is your obligation. You ought to pay back what you owe. Well, Paul says, you have a debt, you have an obligation to put up with each other. <laughs> to put up with someone is going to take patience. It means you're going to be slow to anger. We don't put up with much today, do we? We sound off, we run off, or we run somebody else off. Sometimes we square off. Or we may want to knock someone off, but we seldom bear with one another. And as the world grows and becomes even more populated, there is less space for all of us. And frustrations arise when you find yourself on a street with more houses or in a pew with more faces. Get three people in a room and you're going to have three opinions. So the Christian bears with personality quirks, bears with preferences, bears with matters that are disputable, wherever we might disagree. We have to fight our natural reaction, which might be, well, I'll just, I'll just stop associating with them, right? I'll ignore them. I'll just roll my eyes, cut them out, because it's easier, right? It's easier to ignore people we don't agree with. It's easier to cut those people out of our lives. But we shouldn't. Why not? I mean, I'll agree with you. It is the easier thing to do. It is. But what we've seen historically, and maybe what you've seen even in your own life, is that when people stop talking, bad things begin to happen. When married people stop talking, that's when divorce happens. When civilizations stop, stop talking, that's when civil war happens. When you stop having a human interaction with people that you disagree with, it becomes a lot easier to put those people in a box and to label them those people. It becomes a lot easier to judge them, to dehumanize them. Because people that you stop speaking to lose their humanity. And the key here is found in this second part of this verse. It says, we who are strong have an obligation to bear with the feelings of the weak and not to please ourselves. This goes back to what we learned last week. It's our natural tendency to win the blue ribbon. It's a natural tendency to look out for number one. The key to getting along with others, though, is to put up with others and to be the example that Christ gave us. Christ said, to put ourselves last. He said, take the last seat at the table. Christ got down and washed the feet of his students. You and I must learn not to please ourselves, but instead to sacrifice, sacrificially serve those who are weak for the sake of the kingdom. Paul had this figured out pretty well. He writes in 1 Corinthians 9, we put up with anything rather than hinder the gospel of Christ. And look at Ephesians 4. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with, with one another in love. And I know we, we've talked about pride before, but it's a tough one to get past. Pride is this feeling that we are the only one that's right and everybody else around us is wrong. But when we're humble, we're more willing to put up with people because we can realize that, well, I'm, I'm no picnic either. 
Other people have to put up with me, so I should learn to put up with others. Second, we're to be gentle with those who behave differently than we do, recognizing that the God of grace deals gently with us. Third, when we're patient with others, then we can see that God's working on them and it's a process, just like us. God isn't finished with me. God isn't finished with you either. And fourth, when we bear with one another, we do that with an attitude of love, not indifference, not hatred. In fact, Colossians 3 says, bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Maybe you're having a hard time dealing with someone because you believed they wronged you. Before you can bear with them, you first need to forgive them for whatever they've done. Look at verse 2. Each of us can please his neighbor for his good, build him up, right? But what's our second instruction? Look at verse 2. First we put up, and now it says build up. Verse 2 says, let each of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up. That phrase, build up, that's our, that's our construction term from last week. When we bear with one another, we allow God to use us to help construct, right, to fortify Christians. One of the things we say around Walden Church is that we exist to make more Christians and better Christians. More Christians, that's evangelism. Better Christians, that's building each other up. Do you know what build up means? Of course we do, because we all know what it means to be torn down. Have you ever said that before? Wow, that person really tore into me. They really tore me down. Tearing down means destroy. Tear, it means to topple over. It means to divide. But Jesus calls us to unity, to love. So not only do we need to put up with others, but we need to do whatever we can to build each other up. The prophet Isaiah says, build up, build up. Prepare the road, remove the obstacles out of the way of my people. God doesn't want any obstacles in the way of his people's growth. He wants for his builders on his team to build because the opposite is evil tears down. Evil is unforgiving. Evil seeks to divide. That can never be our message. Look at verse three. Verse three says, for Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. Paul says, look, if you don't believe me, believe Jesus. That quote there is from the book of Psalms. He's showing you that Jesus fulfilled prophecy, but he's also showing you that Jesus took on insults that weren't even his to bear. So he says, put up, build up, look up. If we look up and we fix our eyes on Christ, we're reminded that he did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And if we find ourselves getting really mad at people or judging them or being unforgiving, then it's probably because we are not looking up enough. Proverbs 4 says, but the way of the wicked is like total darkness. They have no idea what they are stumbling over. Look at the story about Jesus from Mark chapter 10. They came to Jericho, and as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples, a great crowd, and Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And many rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said, call him. And they called the blind man, saying to him, take heart, get up, he is calling you. And throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. And Jesus said to him, what do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabbi, let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, go your way, your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him on the way. Now, it's a great story, but let's apply it. All right, let's apply it to our own lives. Open your spiritual eyes. Just as Bartimaeus cries out to Jesus, we have to cry out to him in prayer. Jesus, I am blind. Open my spiritual eyes. I want to seek you. How? When we pray, right? We, we look up. If that's our example, look up. We look up when we pray. 
The blind man asks Jesus for sight. So seek God's vision. Ask God to reveal his will in your life. What is God's plan? What is God's purpose for you? We also look up when we take a bold step in faith. We trust, just like Bartimaeus. He, he, he took a bold step. He cried out to Jesus, even when everybody else around him told him to be quiet. Trust that God will lead you, and you can step out in obedience. And of course, we look up when we follow. The end of the story says that after he was healed, he continued to follow Jesus. Bartimaeus followed Jesus down the road, and therefore we commit our lives to building up and discipleship. Following Jesus is not just a raise my hand, come forward, one-time decision. It's a journey. You can't look up with closed eyes. If you want to discover God's vision for your life, open your eyes. Open your eyes to his word, his guidance, his call. Don't stumble in the darkness of ignorance. Walk in the light of truth. Look at verse 4. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. Now, here the word endurance uh, relates to how we deal with life's problems and, and somebody else's weakness. The Bible encourages us so that we can be filled with hope, hope that brings change, but more importantly, that we change. And what do we call that change? Growing up, right? We say, oh, you've grown up. You've changed. Through instruction, through endurance, through encouragement of reading the scriptures, we grow up. Are you reading your Bible? Let me state this simply and strongly. It's impossible to grow as a Christian if you are not allowing God's word into your life. 1 Peter 2 says, Like newborn babies crave spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation. Change and growth happens in your life when you allow God's word to change you. Because when we open and read our Bibles, we're doing more than just reciting words. We're actually allowing God's word to penetrate our humanity so that we can become everything that God has made us to be. 2 Timothy 3 says, All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Verse 5. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus. Okay? It says we should live in harmony. God's heart is that the church be united, that the church stand together. We need to stand up. Paul covered this for us in the last chapter, in chapter 14. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said Christian community is like the Christian sanctification. It is a gift of God which we cannot claim. We can't create unity on our own. It's a gift from God. But we can choose to live in it, to protect it, to fight for it. Harmony is essential for the health and the vitality of the church. When we are united in purpose, we can accomplish far more than we can as an individual. We can support one another, encourage one another, work together. We can achieve a shared goal when we stand with each other. We can overcome obstacles. We can face challenges. We can make a difference in the world. Verse 6. Together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's simple. We need to speak up. We use the term glorify so much in the church, we probably forget what it means sometimes. To glorify means you cause somebody else's attention to focus on God so that they recognize that God's important. One pastor said glorifying God is making God look good to others. In other words, people should recognize something about God just by watching the way that we live. God's glory is how he shows us who he is. And we have a voice, church. We have a voice. The bride of Christ has a voice in this world. And are we using that voice to praise him? Are we using that voice to bring him glory? What do people hear most from the church, though? 
Is it praise? Is it glory? Or does the outside world just hear a lot of our gripes? How can the world hear about God's glory if we're not speaking with one voice in order to make him look good to others? When we bear with one another and we glorify God with our heart and mouth, we are making God recognized by others. When we stand up, we are to speak up and we are to praise the Lord. Nehemiah 9 says, Stand up and praise the Lord our God, who is from everlasting to everlasting. Easter is coming. It's going to be here in just a few weeks. And right now we are in the season of Lent. Lent has typically been a time not only of looking forward to Easter, but also a time of inward reflection. We are preparing ourselves. We are getting ready for Easter. So right now, this is a time of confession. It's a time to assess, okay, where am I? Before I get to the cross, before I stand at the empty tomb, where am I? Where is my relationship with God? Where is my relationship with others? In light of what we read today, I want to offer here's a couple of things we can do until then. Things we can do until Easter morning. Pray for those problem people. You know, we can't fix people, but God can. We can't always even fix relationships, but God can. Throw your hands up in the air, admit defeat, and ask God to help you with the people who are a problem in your life. And then ask God to change you. I can't change others, but I can change myself. I can grow. I can mature. Pray each day that God will make you more like Christ, to see the world with his eyes and his grace and his love. And then let go of grudges. Forgive faults. Maybe this, East, this Easter you need to just release your grip that's been holding on to a grudge. You know, the longer you hold on to it, the more it gets a hold of you. Is there somebody that you have not forgiven? It's time to let go of your grudges. And that could lead to restoring a broken relationship. What's one positive step that you can make this week that would mend a broken relationship? Do you need to make a call? Do you need to invite somebody over? Does somebody just need to hear your voice? so that they can begin the process of healing? And then perform an act of service. You ever heard the phrase, fake it till you make it? Loving feelings tend to follow loving actions. And if you're waiting for that feeling, you could be waiting a very long time. But when you serve someone, it changes the way you feel about them. They'll be surprised, and so will you. You know, when Abraham Lincoln was running for president, there was a man who ran all across the country and he talked ill of Lincoln. He said a lot of very unkind things and sometimes he would even uh, get to the point and he would say things like, well, you don't want a tall, lanky, ignorant man like that to be president of the United States. And finally, one day, Abraham Lincoln was elected president of the United States. And there came a time that uh, Lincoln had to choose a secretary of war. He looked across the nation and he decided to choose a man by the name of Mr. Stanton. And when Abraham Lincoln stood around his advisors and mentioned that, they said, Mr. Lincoln, you're a fool. You know that Mr. Stanton has been the one that's been saying all these bad things about you. You know what he's done and how he tried to thwart your presidency. You know how he tries to defeat you at every turn. You don't want to work with a person like that, Mr. Lincoln. I mean, haven't you heard all the horrible things that he said about you? And Abraham Lincoln stood around his advisors and he said, yeah, I know about it. I read about it in the paper. I've heard it even from him from myself. But you know, looking across the country at all the people who are available for this job, I think he's the best one. Mr. Stanton became Secretary of War. And later, Abraham Lincoln was assassinated. And if you go to Washington, you will discover one of the greatest statements ever made about Abraham Lincoln was made by Stanton. As Abraham Lincoln came to the end of his life, Stanton stood up and said, 
now he belongs to the ages. That phrase is inscribed forever on the inside of Lincoln's tomb. If Abraham Lincoln had not seen past his own grievances and had continued to perpetuate a fractured relationship, Stanton would have gone to his grave hating Lincoln. Lincoln would have gone to his grave hating Stanton. We live in a culture of broken relationships, mainly because we no longer know what it means to live by the power of the Spirit. We spend most of our time living by selfishness and the flesh, living in constant turmoil with troubles and grief and pain in our life. That is not the life that God wants you to live. Let each of us please their neighbor for his good, to build him up. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another that together you may, with one voice, glorify God. This is the life God desires for you, this kind of life. May the bride of Christ demonstrate that life to the world. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for this Lenten season. We thank you for this time of reflection, these 40 days where we can pause, step out of ourselves and look inward to wrestle with our questions, with our sin, with our doubt, with our darkness. Lord, as we consider Paul's words, and where we are in our relationships with others, we would just ask that you would give us the eyes of Christ. Perhaps it is a person that we know, a name, a face. It could be a relative, a neighbor, or a person we haven't spoken to in years. It could also be a group of people who irritate us and they are nameless, faceless, but they always end up being at the receiving end of our jokes and our hate. May we learn and grow. May we mature. May we keep our eyes focused on you. May we continue to read your word and have the word of God just inside of us that we might find ways to treat our brother as ourself, to love our enemies, to pray for them, to live in unity with the world around us in this short time that we have. May we let go of grievances and grudges. May we walk in unity and peace and restoration. We pray this Easter that every church is filled to the walls that every seat in every church is taken, that it's standing room only in the back, that every classroom on, at, during Sunday school is filled with children, everyone listening and hearing the good news, the resurrection of your son and promised life everlasting. Amen. Hey, we're, thank you so much for coming out and worshiping with us today. Speaking of Easter, we have three Easter services at Walden Church. We have a seven o'clock sunrise service. That'll be on the Yacht Club lawn. You just go to where the flagpole is. We'll have a bunch of chairs set up for you. Uh, it's a beautiful service. You get to sit outside, you get to sing, and we get to watch the sunrise come up over the lake. Then we'll have two services here at the church. They're both on the hour. So nine o'clock and 11 o'clock. The services are completely identical. Pick the service that works best for you and your family. I love you guys, and we'll see you soon.